or summaries of long stories which are recounted in a creative way and with a faith perspective. Today, we prefer our stories in small, easy to digest chunks, says Vicente Groyon, an award-winning Filipino writer. This is true especially among those who live and work in mega cities like Metro Manila, Metro Jakarta, Metro Bangkok, and so on, and highly urbanized environments where many people endure long hours of work or on the way to their workplaces and where few have the luxury of time to listen to long stories or to read through long stories. Groyon says, we live in insanely money-oriented times required to be productive at unheard-of velocities. The, bre the brevity of a story does not condemn it to worthlessness or oblivion. Let us think of many parables or short stories of Jesus, such as this one told in one sentence. The kingdom of, God, of heaven is like yeast that a woman hit, took and hid in three measures of flour until it worked all through the dough. The parables of Jesus, Jesus, a creative Jewish storyteller, are described by Taiwanese theologian C.S. Song. And I'm glad uh, to mention that uh, Dr. Jose de Mesa introduced Asian theologians to, to me and my classmates when we were still studying theology. So we learned about C.S. Song, um, Samuel Ryan, M.M. Thomas, Kosuki Koyama, and so on. And I'm also glad that Professor Poe uh, told me that his dissertation advisor was C.S. Song. Okay. So, C.S. Song says that the parables of Jesus are in essence stories, brief and succinct in form, but long and deep in meaning. And the parables of Jesus are told in plain and commonplace language, but are provocative and soul-searching in their implication. Let me share with you my translation of the very short story, Santissima Trinidad, Most Holy Trinity, from the 2011 collection, Isang Daang Kisla, 100 Sparks or 100 Rays of Light by multi-awarded Filipino writer, Abdon Balde Jr. So please listen intently, it's a very short story. I told Cora, my daughter, to look after her son, my grandson Jekyll, the stubborn Jekyll, to look after his needs. Cora was negligent too, busy with Facebook. So there, the naughty Jekyll, just three years old, asked for a stick of snack from his grandmother. And this Trinidad of mine could not refuse the grandson even with rheumatism and after an operation in which some metal was inserted in her hip bone, she tried to reach for the cabinet and unable, pulled the chair which happened to have a broken leg, climbed up on it and, oh my. Both Cora and I heard the thud on the floor. I thought it was some sack of rice. When Jerry, Cora's husband arrived. He, she, and Jekyll are still a whole family, an extension of ours. But what about me? Cora can fix the bed, the pillow, but when it is hot, will she be patient enough to keep on fanning me? Who will, who will button me when I am unbuttoned? Who will clean my dentures? And in the toilet, Santissima! Sometimes I tell myself, I wish it had been me. End of story. C.S. Song asks, is there anything you can do in times of helplessness except to tell stories? And humor in story gives us courage. Song also adds, there are no stories shared in hell. And that is a major reason for its hellishness. In, in my Bible study group, we talked about the Santissima Trinidad story, which elicited both laughter and groans. And we, had a lot of, we have a lot of senior citizens in the Bible study group, so it really resonated. Eventually, we talked about the Holy Trinity, 
that the Holy Trinity is first a story before it is a dogmatic teaching or a doctrine or a formula. The doctrinal expression most the doctrinal expression, most Holy Trinity, carries the spark of a story. And true believers in the story will appreciate these questions, questions that came out of our discussion. Do we still know the inner regions of life without the most Holy Trinity? Is the spirit of the beloved Son our welcome coolness in the heat? Does belief in the does belief in the Holy Trinity make a difference to the way we attend to our elderly kin in the home, especially if they suffer from a disability, deteriorating health, or a degenerative disease? Does belief, does belief in the Holy Trinity make a difference? Does Trinitarian theology make an impact on our day-to-day -day lives? Do we see Christ's spirit of love in persons like old and kind Trinidad, who would patiently fan her disabled husband in the heat of the day or the heat of the night, or would wash his stains away in the toilet? A statement attributed to Origen of Alexandria from the 3rd century says, The Christian life is full of Trinity. Are there enough believers who discover the many sparks of the Trinity in their day-to-day -day lives? Do we sparkle with the Trinitarian story? Do we radiate sparks of the Trinitarian story through our everyday acts of patience, kindness, and generosity? Those are questions that can be part of the, that can, uh, we will probably have to wrestle with to come up with a, a story theology of the Holy Trinity. Anyway. In the beginning were stories, not texts. This is a, a 2011 pub, uh, publication of C.S. Song, uh, his latest book on story theology, in which he attempts to show how stories in the Bible and those outside it can impact one another, enabling theological visions to come out into the open. Song confidently asserts that theological texts are descendants of stories, especially biblical stories. The descriptive story precedes the prescriptive teaching. The captivating or compelling story comes first. The commandment or demanding doctrine follows. For a song, there are stories within a story. When it is a good story in the sense of compelling from one generation to another. And each story within a story has a meaning that either illuminates the primary meaning of the story or discloses different layers of meaning in the story. For some, the hidden stories and theological insights are revealed when a biblical story and a compelling story outside the Bible are retold and reinterpreted in light of each other. Among so many fo folk tales, myths, and short stories outside the Bible, how does the theologian select the materials or ingredients for story theology? Uh, Song describes one approach as doing story theology within a renewing community. So, doing story theology within a renewing community. Okay. Song suggests that the true story theologian is one who is rooted in a faith community there and is a familiar participant in its life and activities. Furthermore, the theologian has to become a sufficiently familiar figure to be allowed within the community to hear its traditional, resonant, or compelling stories. As mentioned by Father Giorgio Fong, you have to be allowed, for example, by the indigenous community. And if they do not want to, to let you hear their stories, be patient, do not force yourself. Curiosity is an essential element in doing story theology. According to Song, the story theologian, well, this is Song and my addition, the story theologian is a receptive story listener and humble story seeker who is curious about the stories that fathers and mothers, grandparents and family and communal storytellers tell to their children, grandchildren, and kith and kin, especially within poor or struggling families, households, communities, and kinship networks that live in the midst of majority groups of other faith traditions. 
In the vast Asian mainland, the households and communities of the baptized constitute the Lord's little flocks in relation to their neighbors in great numbers who embrace other sacred traditions. Now, what kinds of stories are usually transmitted from one generation to the next within many families, households, and communities in Asia? Surely among them would be stories about family relationships, family problems and problem solving, stories about friendship, courtship, marriage, and widowhood, stories about seasonal and unusual celebrations, stories about childbearing, child raising, and parenting, stories about hospitality and household economics, stories about disability, illness, and healing, stories about aging, old age, and deterioration, stories about death and dying well or badly, and stories about the actions of strangers, outsiders, or enemies, which might, in, uh, in the case of strangers and outsiders today, they might include refugees and migrants. In the case of enemies, for some communities, they might include the governing authorities. In the case of zealous believers, you will also have shared stories. Uh, their shared stories will include those of the presence and actions of the Spirit or heavenly agents of Christ in the ordinary and extraordinary events, in the stages and seasons of life, and stories about the snares, the snares of demonic forces. Thus, story theologies in Asia will likely be theologies, Christologies, ecclesiologies of everyday life, and the seasons and stages of life in the home, the kinship network, and the community. Story theologies from the perspective of the Lord's little flocks in Asia will retell stories and reveal the hidden stories as regards the struggles and sufferings and the forms of generosity and solidarity in their day-to-day -day lives. Thus, these story theologies will not only articulate their everyday activities, but also their daily life of feelings and desires. The holy and human emotive needs of men and women, young and senior adults, children and adolescents. And so for song, empathy, the ability to imagine and share in another's feelings is an essential element for doing story theology. Among the neglected features, um, okay, in our times, the daily, the daily life of feelings and desire seems to get better attention and to find more space in worship in the Pentecostal and charismatic communities than in other ecclesial communities. Now, among the neglected features of the daily life of the little ones which have to be rediscovered and retold by story theologians are the humor and the little ironies, especially in the lives of the more vulnerable people and households. <coughs> I will just go forward. Now, according to Aristotle, uh, uh, the human being is the only animal with the capacity to laugh. But he defined... Uh, the human being as a rational animal. But more than rational animals, we are story-loving animals, storytelling and story-loving animals. And we are first hearers of stories before we become subjects of history. Now, according to uh, the anthropologist Victor Turner, Victor Turner, Many rites of passage and seasonal, seasonal rituals of tribal societies have played some ludic and even comic aspects like joking relationships, sacred games, riddles, mock ordeals, holy fooling and clowning and trickster tales. And let me mention that a mentor of several Filipinos of the Catholic University of Louvain, the late theologian George Disraver, who passed away here in the Philippines last year, once wrote that among postmodernists, Ironic expression and nonviolent, ludicrous action are modest but meaningful means by which they try to help liberate persons from the compulsive logic of total domination, which is hidden and inherent in modernity's great stories. Now, ironic and comic expressions can be needles for <coughs> bursting the bubbles of egoliaths egoliaths in the community and society and deb debilitating the legitimacy of complex forms of exploitation in our times. In the New Testament, the fourth gospel abounds with wisdom motives and irony is one characteristic of the Johannine literary style. 
uh, I'd like to mention that what uh, um, Father uh, Belida said uh, some, uh, a while ago that the persons in authority who uh, are, uh, become violent, coercive, usually lack a sense of humor. Okay? They do not know how to laugh at themselves periodically. Without humor, there is scant hope for peace, either for the individual or for humanity, according to the interreligious thinker, Raymond Panikar. And so the story theologian, the story theologian can recover and reproduce the humor of the little ones, the humor of the belittled ones in history. And this will be humor from a tragic comic vision. This, should, this is not superficial humor because this is humor that is born out of a history of suffering. And this is perplexing and perhaps disturbing humor, which we can describe as the shield of the small uh, and, uh, and uh, you could say a disarming weapon of the weak. It is humor that involves a tragic comic vision. Okay. And so, just as just as if the kingdom of God can be hidden and eventually revealed in the action of a Galilean peasant woman or homemaker who hid yeast in 27 kilos of flour and then baked an extravagant amount of bread, extravagant for her own household, similarly, the heavenly kingdom could be hidden and eventually revealed in the day-to-day -day sharing of humorous stories that provoke plentiful laughter in the families, households, and neighborhoods of people who feel harassed and helpless or hopeless. And we see this, for example, we see this, for example, in the uh, parables of Jesus. Uh, let me just, uh, there's this quote from uh, Amiji Levin, uh, um, a uh, Jewish scholar of the New Testament. Jesus knew that the best teaching comes from stories that make us laugh even as they make us uncomfortable. And the parables, if we take them seriously, not as meaning, but as soliciting our meaning making, and if we allow ourselves to be open to various interpretations, become not tools for shaming or inculcating guilt, but for good, hard lessons learned with a sense of playfulness. And these are lessons about how to live in community, how to determine what ultimately matters, how to live the life that God um, wants us to live. Now, many compelling stories inside and outside the Bible have been domesticated and or turned into dull and dry doctrines. And uh, the story theologies in Asia will attempt to bring out the engaging, the engaging strangeness of such stories by revealing the hidden stories that can comfort the little ones, comfort the hidden ones, the ones who need comfort and challenge disciples who are already comfortable. Okay. Now, to reveal, this is similar, well, this can be uh, compared to the Jewish practice of creating midrash. The, pra the practice of the story theologian of creating and revealing hidden stories in, in, in the primary story. So, we have to immerse our, ourselves in the story through repeated and sustained listening, reflection, reading, study, prayer, and dialogue with people who are open to more than one interpretation and are, who are willing to use or stretch their imagination. And these hidden stories originate from God's creative spirit, which loves to blow in open spaces, the open spaces of the story and the open spaces of the imagination. Imagination is very important in aesthetic theology and in creative theology. The imagination of the storytellers and the story listeners. And there will be revela the revelation of hidden stories lead to additions, expansions, or reinterpretations of the <coughs> biblical stories and the resonant stories outside the Bible. So, three points. The story theologian, story theologies will attempt to retell resonant stories, to reveal hidden stories that comfort those who need comfort and challenge those who are already comfortable. Second, the Spirit creates hidden stories in the open spaces of compelling stories inside the Bible and outside the Bible, and the open spaces of the imagination of story lovers, story storytellers, and story listeners. And the story, story theologies will be theologies of everyday life. Theologies of seasons of life. Theologies of stages of life. And they will 
recover among the things that need to be recover, recovered will be the perplexing humor and the tragic comic vision of the little ones and the hidden ones in history. Thank you very much. And good afternoon.